Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and Princeton University, I am like to thank you for joining us as Senator Bill Bradley begins a national book tour on this, the campus of his alma mater. I will not attempt to steal his thunder, other than to say that his newest book, We Can All Do Better. There are many ways you can say that title, but this is the way the senator would like it said. We can all do better. It's very much the measure of the man who wrote it. Thoughtful, forthright, and deeply informed by his lifelong commitment to the public good. Indeed, in the words of Henry Kissinger, this volume is a clarion call to Americans of every political stripe and walk of life to stand up and demand of themselves and of their leaders the fair play, idealism, discipline, and optimism that made America a beacon for the world. In this book, Bill argues that our fate as individuals, even at our best, is tied to the success of our national community. And this reverence for the whole, coupled with exceptional achievement, has been a defining feature of his life. At Princeton, as a member of the great class of 1965, he was the quintessential scholar-athlete, earning honors in history and an unsurpassed record in basketball. He led the Tigers to three Ivy League titles and the NCAA... <laughs> now we're getting to the good stuff, right? <laughs> and the NCAA Championship Final Four, while earning a gold medal in the 1964 Olympics. He then went on to study at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, postponing a 10-year career with the New York Knicks not the usual choice for a first round draft pick. Bill helped carry the Knicks to their only two NBA championships and then befitting a man whose senior thesis examined Harry Truman's 1940 senatorial campaign, exchanged his jersey for the mantle of a U.S. Senator. He represented New Jersey for three terms from 1979 to 1997 and brought to this role the same dedication he showed as a professional athlete. Preferring reasoned discourse to polemics, he immersed himself in a wide array of complex issues, from tax reform to race relations to Western water allocation to international relations. As he put it, questions of structure, whether on taxes, trade, or the environment, always interested me more than issues of marginal gain or questions of blame or strategies for partisan political advantage. Since leaving office, Bill has remained a much admired public presence, pursuing what the Prince, Princeton Alumni Weekly has aptly called a crusade for substance. He campaigned as a candidate for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination in 2000 when he called for investments in the social fabric of our nation, from health care to education to anti-poverty measures. And unlike many politicians, he refused to rule out raising taxes to meet such costs, a mark not only of integrity, but also of his belief in our larger responsibilities to one another. He has authored seven books and hosts a weekly radio program called American Voices, which celebrates the accomplishments of unheralded individuals who have made a difference in their own communities. I cannot do better than to close with an excerpt from Bill's honorary degree citation from our university. Powerful of mind and body, compassionate of spirit, he is one to whom others look with confidence and hope for a sense of where we are and what we might become. This is also the promise of the book we launched today. Bill's remarks will be followed by a question and answer session, and this in turn will be followed by a book sale and signing here on the stage. And now please join me in welcoming a tiger of the finest stripe, Senator Bill Bradley.
Thank you very much, uh, President Tillman, for that uh, overly generous introduction. And I uh, just want to say that as one alumnus, and I'm sure it's shared by thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, Princeton is very lucky to have you as president of this university. I want to say a few special welcomes um, and appreciation. First to uh, my former wife, Ernestine, who's here today, and to, that's right, she deserves applause. <laughs> to uh, Professor Walter Hinder and his wife, Dee Linda, who are great family friends, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I also want to say a special appreciation to uh, Rick Wright, who was a classmate here at Princeton and played on the basketball team, and I have a few stories about him that I won't tell. <laughs> and then the treasurer of my first uh, run for the Senate, Peter Burke, who is here today. It's great to have him here. And then, of course, Betty Sapo, a Princeton resident and my chief fundraiser for many years, probably the most unique fundraiser in the history of politics. <laughs> but the, the most effective too. So it's a great pleasure to be here and kick off this book tour. This will be about uh, eight or nine cities and then we'll see how it's doing. And uh, beginning it in Princeton is a very appropriate thing. Um, this is, uh, I've written five or six other books and President Tillman gave me a very nice introduction. I've also had introductions that sometimes misfired for example, I was introduced once on one of the book tour by someone who said, uh, uh, I give you Bill Bradley, whose book, when you put it down, you'll never pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I recall, it's a, this is a thin volume, it's about 167, 170 pages. Unlike previous volumes that were probably 200 pages too long, uh, but I remember once in the Senate, we were in the Energy Committee, and um, the chairman of the Energy Committee was Bennett Johnson, and Henry Kissinger was there to talk on his geopolitics of oil. And his memoirs had just come out. And so uh, the chairman of the committee said, uh, Dr. Kissinger, we welcome you here. We know your insights are going to help us understand the geopolitics of oil. And uh, your book, your m new memoir that just came out, it is a wonderful book. But I want to caution members of the committee, uh, don't read it in bed. Because if you read it in bed and it falls out of your hand, it'll break your leg. <laughs> so this is not that kind of book. So how did this book come about? Last summer, like many of you, I was appalled by the debt limit debacle that almost pushed the country to the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, we were still then in two wars. We also had um, a, a 30 year period of stagnant income for middle income families in America. And I thought I have to do something. But I was not uh, a senator anymore. I did not have my hand on the levers of power. All I had was my experience and my desire to try to help as a citizen. And I recall that, you know, I played basketball for many years, and when I see a basketball game, I think I see different levels to the game. And in politics, having had the experience of uh, 20 years in politics, I think I might see uh, what is possible. And so I decided to uh, write a book. And the title of the book, the inspiration of the title, comes from Abraham Lincoln's second State of the Union address in 1862. The war has been going on uh, about a year. It's not going well for the North. It is uh, a time of six to eight months before the Emancipation Proclamation. And Lincoln sends this incredible address to uh, the Congress. In it, he says, among other things, it's one of the great addresses of American history, in my opinion. He says, um, we can only succeed by con in concert. 
In other words, we can only succeed by working together. It's not can any of us imagine better, but can all of us do better? And that question was the basis for me to start the book. Can we all do better? Uh, I think it's a relevant question. If you look out and see the fragility and inequality of uh, our economy, if you see the direction of our foreign policy, if you see the paralysis in our national dialogue, it's irrelevant. Can we all do better? It also exists on a personal level. Can each of us do better? That's why all is a critical phrase. Can we take care of our health ourselves better? Can we educate ourselves as much as possible? Can we save? Can we find that part of ourself that honors the selfless and project it into the world we live in? All of those things are a part of what this title meant to me. Uh, my motivation was to try to give people hope at a time where, in the wake of those events that I just described, the debt limit debacle, the middle class stagnation, the wars, a lot of people would come up to me and they'd say, you know, we don't have any hope that anything can happen. Nothing can happen. And so I wrote this book to try to say, yes, things can happen and this can be a better country. I, in the book, it's a lot of history. I remind people that we've had difficult times in the past, depression after depression after depression. We've had wars after wars. We've had flaws in our democracy that we corrected. And there is no reason that now we can't have the same result. I wanted to remind people that my own personal view that there's a goodness in the American people and I wanted to assert very strongly that our political institutions are flexible enough that we can deal with our problems. So those were the motivations. I also have confined the book. That's why it's relatively brief, so you can probably read it in an evening or an afternoon. Uh, that the three subjects that I talk about in the book are our economy, our foreign policy, and the political system itself. And when I talk about the economy, I say the major issue is the fact that in the last 30 years, middle class families in this country have had a very tough time. The median income in 2010, for example, was the same as it was in 1996. There are 66 million Americans today who live one paycheck away from economic catastrophe. There are a lot of explanations for that, for why wages and income has not gone up. I mean, it, it ranges from the outsourcing of jobs. We've closed 40,000 factories and lost 6 million jobs in the last decade alone, to technological change that made it possible to do as much work with less workers, to the fact that labor unions are representing fewer and fewer people in this country. All of these are relevant facts. But the question now is, well, what do you do? And so what I tried to say, set out to say, well, how can we get those incomes up? How can we employ more people? Because in the long run, However much we tax the wealthy, and I think there should be increases in taxes, it will not be enough to move the economy forward. The only thing that will move the economy forward is that vast middle class that will have the resources to spend to get the economy going. And how do we trigger that? The way I suggest in the book briefly, and I won't tell you the whole book because I know you'll probably want to buy it and underline. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the, the basic argument is that corporations, non-financial corporations in America today have $1.8 $1 trillion in cash and financial assets on their books, $1.8 trillion. If 20% of that money went into hiring workers, our unemployment if the worker was hired at the median income, which is $49,000 roughly, the unemployment rate in our country would be 5%. So the question is, how do we convince 
corporate leaders to hire people. And so when you talk to corporate leaders, they say, well, the reason we're not is that things are so uncertain and we have no confidence in the future and therefore we have to be prepared for any eventuality. So the first question would be confidence. How do you restore confidence in the long-term fiscal health of the United States? That's where deficit reduction comes in. Not deficit reduction in the next year or two, but deficit reduction in the four, five, six, seven, eight, ten year uh, area. And you have to do that by tackling all the big issues if you're going to reduce the budget deficit. You have to have a willingness to tackle the Defense Department and make sure that our defense is sized for the threats of the 21st century and not for the 20th century. You have to touch Social Security, you have to touch health care, and you have to touch taxes. And anybody that tells you that we can deal with the debt crisis without touching taxes is really not telling you the truth. And what we need in America more than anything else right now are politicians who will put country ahead of party and tell people the truth. So I view the possibility of that deficit reduction as real. Come November, December of this year, we'll either have another train wreck, as we did last summer, or the parties will come together to get the deficit reduction that they promised the American people they would get in November and December of 2012. So if we manage to do that, that addresses the issue of confidence. But that doesn't address the issue of demand. If I'm a corporation, I have to decide how many widgets I produce. Well, part of my decision to determine how many widgets I produce is to determine, well, how many widgets will people want to buy? And corporations say today there's not enough demand. So one of the key things is to stimulate demand in this country. And I think there, the way to do that is with a massive, a massive infrastructure program. And by massive, I mean over a trillion dollars over five or six years. And so it occurs to you, well, what would it be spent for? And I would say, instead of doing what we did in 2009, when we had to get the money out quickly, we did shovel-ready projects, which were the old projects that mayors and county executives had on their books for many years, and so they just put them out there. And it, it did employ people for a while, but it didn't dramatically improve our productivity because it was not a structural necessity. But there are things that are. For example, high-speed rail from Boston to Washington, or from Seattle to Los Angeles. A new air traffic control system that could dramatically reduce the waiting time and loss of productivity in the airports of this country. Imagine, the air traffic control system now is the same as it was in the 1960s. These people in a, tire, in a tower watching these red dots. It is absolutely uh, ridiculous. So we need to have a massive investment in 50 high-priority national projects. And we need to cost those projects out so that we have an accurate number, as opposed to what happens often in politics with a project, which is to say the politician comes in to his uh, staff and says, well, we're going to do this. How much will it cost? No work's been done. And so they don't know how much. Well, give me a number. I need a number. And inevitably, it's below what it ultimately turned out to be. So we need this infrastructure. The question is, well, then how do you do infrastructure, which costs a trillion dollars over six years, 200 billion a year, and deficit reduction? Aren't those antithetical? And I would argue that if you put in deficit reduction now that will go into effect in two years, three, four, five, and you see those years in the out years, that, it's this, that the game has changed, uh, we'll then have to borrow less money as a country, we now borrow $1.4 trillion from the Chinese. And we will not have to borrow as much money. But the Chinese will still have dollars. And so my argument is the Chinese could buy reconstruction bonds in this country that would allow us to finance our infrastructure projects and in the process lay the foundation for economic growth for the next 100 years in America. And to me, that's a, uh, it's a, it would also transform the US-Chinese relationship. 
and demonstrate that we are rivals, but we could also be partners. And the result could be a win-win for both countries. So that is what I lay out in the book as the midterm. Short term, what do we do about these next two years? Well, I suggest that what we do is if anybody uh, hires a worker in the next two years and doesn't lay anyone else off, that the federal government ought to pay 30% of the cost of that worker. And the result would be that companies still wouldn't hire workers just to get the 30% because they'd have to pay 70%, but if they, it could on the margin encourage hiring. I'd cap it at $50 billion, first come, first serve. And the result could be a dramatic reduction in unemployment in the short term. But the caveat here is that no federal dollar would be spent unless a job was created. So that's the short term, midterm is what I, what about long term? Long term, you know, we have so many people in this country who are not only unemployed, but underemployed and have dropped out of the workforce. Many people who are elderly who would like to work, and yet they're not the jobs. Well, that requires a greater structural change, and that change is the tax system. And I would suggest that what we do is right now, 40% of federal revenues comes from taxes on employment, Social Security, Medicare, unemployment, and that's a disincentive to hire. So instead of funding the Social Security, Medicare, and unemployment funds with taxes on employment, we ought to fund it with taxes on things, taxes on materials, plastic, aluminum, taxes on energy inefficient buildings and cars, taxes on uh, uh, a non-labor value added tax or whatever. And if we did that, we would be sending a signal to all businesses to hire people as opposed to discouraging them because of the cost embodied in the employment taxes. So that's the program that is laid out in the book. In part, there are a lot of very interesting anecdotes and there are many insights that I've not given you today that you will only get if you <laughs> read the book. But uh, that's the basic outline on the economy. On foreign policy, and I won't take too much time here, on foreign policy, the question I pose is, every American believes that democracy is the best form of government. America is divided about whether we should fight wars to promote democracy around the world. And that is a debate that's not new. That's gone on since the beginning of our country. And I argue that the thing that's most important for America is to be able to lead by our example of a pluralistic democracy with a growing economy that takes more and more people to higher economic grounds. And in that regard, immigration is critical. Why? Because the so-called replacement rate which is the number of people born versus the number of people died, if you're gonna maintain a stable population, it has to be about 2.1. It is now 1.9, headed toward 1.8. In Europe, it's 1.6. In some countries, it's 1.2, which means that we will not have enough people working in the next 30 years to pay the taxes that will guarantee Social Security having adequate revenue, Medicare having adequate revenue, the government being able to make infrastructure investments, et cetera. And therefore, immigration is the one way we get an adequate labor supply in America. You know, since the, since the Great Depression, the issue was a labor shortage, a labor, labor surplus, unemployment. But as we look out at our birth rates and we look at the next uh, 20 years, we could very well have a labor shortage absent immigration. Now, Lee Kuan Yew, who's um, a man I've admired for many years, he's the founder of Singapore, one of the prime ministers, was the prime minister there for many years, uh, talked about in the 21st century, intelligence will determine the success of nations. And intelligence is talent and therefore the size of your talent pool is relevant. And he points out that China has a talent, talent pool of 1.3 billion people. But he also points out that the United States has a talent pool of 7 billion people 
In other words, the whole world. As long as we stay open and allow talent to come to America and encourage it to come to America, that will generate the next new thing to advance along with the, the domestic version of those things, we're going to be uh, fine. And the question really is, can we see that far down the road? Or will we get sucked up in the debate of the moment, in the crisis of the moment, in the news cycle of the moment? Because long term is absolutely uh, critical. And that, of course, then brings us to China. And uh, that's really I th my, one of my favorite parts of the book. And I won't tell you anything about it. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it basically makes the point that the 21st century is a, is, a, is a time where there's an economic competition going on globally and not a military com com competition. And China is an economic competitor, but it's not necessarily a military adversary. And clearly the Chinese have a long-term view. Just look at the things they've done and are doing in the last 10 years. They have built, uh, they're in the process of trying to build high-speed rail lines from China to Southeast Asia, across Central Asia to London, across Northern uh, Siberia to Berlin, out of which they can suck all the resources of Central Asia and Southeast Asia. They are talking about building dams on the Mekong and Irrawaddy and Brahmaputra rivers, which flow from the Himalayas into Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia, thereby being able to influence the countries of South and Southeast Asia without a gunshot. And they're also draining the world of resources. I mean, I grew up in a small town in Missouri. The Chinese showed up there uh, two years ago to try to figure out how they could get uh, iron through a non-existent port to export. So they are they're following a very specific game plan. You might have also seen they wanted to buy uh, 239, I think, square miles of Iceland. And the government said, no, but why do they want to buy so much land in Iceland? And the guy who wanted to buy it, who's one of the wealthiest real estate moguls of China, said, uh, I, I want to build a resort. <laughs> of course, I don't think you need that much land to build a resort. I think the more relevant question was Iceland, which is not a part of Europe and not a part of the United States, but is on a very strategic trade route that as global warming occurs will open up over the North Pole. And they want to position themselves. So the Chinese are long-term thinkers. And as they are doing all these things, what were we doing? We were pouring our resources and our precious lives into two wars in the Middle East. And this was captured for me best by the front page of the New York Times on October 29th. The front page of the New York Times had two stories. One story said, Europeans go to China asking for investment in Euro Rescue Fund. China, exercising its newfound economic power in the world, said, well, we might provide it, but you've got to change the rules under the World Trade Organization so that it's more difficult to sanction us by making us a market economy, exercising their power in the world, their economic power. Meanwhile, the story right next to it said, Western business looks for investment opportunities in Libya. <laughs> in other words, we were picking over our latest Mideast adventure while the Chinese were stripping across the world with the power that they have because of a long-term strategy. So I would argue that this is a time for us to think long-term, to resist uh, military adventures in faraway lands, concentrate on our people, concentrate on our economy, concentrate on our growth and raising our standard of living in this country. And so that's among the things that the foreign policy uh, section talks about. The last uh, thing was political institutions. And political institutions are um, under siege right now. You saw the story yesterday that, uh, or today, that Senator Dick Lugar, 
of Indiana lost in a primary challenge to a Tea Party candidate who said today on national television why I'm promoting the book, so I'm going around doing all these TV shows, and I was on right before, I was there waiting while he was being interviewed and spoke, and he said that the time of collegiality is over, the time of confrontation has arrived. And I would suggest to you that this is a recipe for disaster. Our system of government is established on reasonable compromise. If people stand at each end of the opposite ends of the room and shout at each other, there is no progress. We wouldn't have had a constitution if there wasn't a compromise. And I'll give you a little historical vignette. The book has a lot of historical vignettes, but I'll just share one of them. Um, it's uh, George Washington, he's taken over as president. He's got a pretty good cabinet. His treasury secretary is Alexander Hamilton. His secretary of state is Thomas Jefferson. And um, they have a bit of a problem. It's a new government. And during the Revolutionary War, the federal government borrowed a lot of money. And so did the states borrow a lot of money. But Washington wants to have one government that is credit worthy. And so one of the things he suggests is that, and Hamilton pushes him to suggest, is that the federal government assume the debts of the states. Now, Thomas Jefferson's from Virginia. Virginia's a frugal place. They don't have a big debt because they paid it off while well, Massachusetts and South Carolina and other places had this debt that they didn't do anything to reduce. And so what, what Washington says is solve this problem. You two are reasonable men, go out and solve this problem. So they go out and talk, they can't figure out what to do, can't figure out what to do. Finally, Hamilton says to Jefferson, Mr. Jefferson, if we moved the capital of the United States from New York to the banks of the Potomac, would you get the Virginia delegation to support a federal bailout for state debt? Jefferson said, yes, the deal was cut and America became one of the most credit-worthy countries in the world, which was very relevant a short time later when Napoleon, pressed in Europe by the wars he wanted to fight, uh, decided to sell Louisiana, which would double the size of the United States. Why were we able to do that? Because out of the $15 million we paid for Louisiana, we borrowed $11 million, which would never have happened had there not been a reasonable compromise. And so I look out there at our country today and I see just, uh, sometimes it's unbelievable. I see uh, two fundamental structural problems in our democracy. One is that <clears throat> uh, the way congressional district lines are drawn rewards the most extreme view. For example, what has? How do we draw the lines of congressional districts? Every 10 years, there's a census, and then we draw the lines. And we draw the lines um, by the state legislature draws those lines, usually. A partisan state legislature wants to maximize interests of Republicans or Democrats, depending on who's there. And they draw districts that look like spaghetti sometimes to maximize that. As a result of that practice called gerrymandering, um, out of 435 representatives of the United States Congress today, only about 50 are in competitive districts. If I'm in a 60-40 Democratic district, I don't have to listen to Republicans, or vice versa, if a Republican is in a Republican district. What I have to worry about is a challenge in the primary from my left, a Republican, from his right. And so what I want to do is avoid that possibility. And I avoid that possibility by making sure I don't displease any of the zealots on my left or right, and I take the most extreme positions, i.e., the man who just replaced Dick Luger, who said he thinks being a senator is simply shouting down the other side until they, live, until they break. And to me, the result is that we have a polarization in the politics today that is not serving our interests because if you're in the opposite corner shouting at each other, you don't come to the middle and compromise to move ourselves forward on the job creation, 
on health care, on pensions, on education, or whatever, or deficit reduction. So the second problem in our structure of our democracy today is the role of money in politics. I mean, it's getting worse and worse. Uh, when I ran for the first time in New Jersey in 1978, I spent $1.68 million, Betty and Peter raised it all, thank you very much for doing it, $1.68 million, and Ernestine went to all the fundraisers, so $1.68 million. John Corzine spent $63 million to get elected in 2000. That is a, a, a extrapolate from that to the whole system, the whole system. Uh, 10 years ago, about $1.5 billion a year was spent on lobbyists. Now it's $3.5 billion. And just take in the last uh, two years, take the cycle 09, 2009, 2010. In that cycle, the financial industry contributed $318 million to politicians in Washington. The healthcare industry contributed $145 million to politicians in Washington, and the energy industry contributed $75 million to politicians in Washington. Is it any wonder that what we ended up with was a watered down financial reform bill, or that in the healthcare bill there was no public option to compete with private health insurance, or that we didn't even get around to doing an energy bill? even though we're sending billions of dollars to autocrats on the other side of the world to feed our oil habit. Money is playing a destructive role in our politics. And until we deal with it head on, we're gonna to continue to have a lack of progress. We're gonna to continue to have legislation for some people as opposed to all people. And we need legislation for all people. And there, as with the districting, there's an answer, which is a commission, a citizen commission to draw the lines as contiguous as possible. And on money in politics, there's an answer. It's a constitutional amendment. Why do we need a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics? Well, we have the Supreme Court we have, who said in 1976, when Watergate happened earlier and they limited the amount of money in the campaign, you can't limit the amount of money spent in the political campaign because to do so, you're limiting somebody's right to free speech. So the result is that a person with a lot of money has a greater advantage, and that's why 47% of the senators and congressmen are millionaires today, and 9% of the country is. And so the reality is there are answers. So you need a constitutional amendment. And on top of that, if Buckley wasn't bad enough, in 2010, get this argument, the, uh, a case was brought called Citizens United. And Citizens United said that corporations have a right to free speech too. Well, why do corporations have a right to free speech? Why do we even entertain that idea? Because under the law, 1886 law, Southern Pacific versus Santa Clara County, um, the Supreme Court, the robber baron court at the time, concluded that a corporation was a person because Southern Pacific was suing Santa Clara County on due process grounds for you know, you know, the early uh, the Civil War amendments. And they succeeded. So since 1886, corporations are people. And now, under the law. And so now, the Supreme Court, by analogy, saying, well, you can't deny the right to a person's speech, and because a corporation is a person, can't deny a right to corporations. And ladies and gentlemen, you just have the super PACs of today. And in the next six months, you're going to see an orgy of spending that is going to be absolutely mind boggling. And a lot of it are going to be lies. A lot of it, you're going to get inundated with things. I don't know if you will so much in New Jersey. New Jersey might not be as competitive as other states, but it could. And so you cannot deal with this problem because of the Supreme Court without a constitutional amendment that says federal, state, and local government may limit the amount of money spent in the political campaign. Simple. Have we done this before? Yeah. When? 19th century. Why? 
because senators under the Constitution were supposed to be elected by the states, uh, House of Representatives elected by the people. They ran every two years. They represented the people. Senators represented the states, so they were nominated and selected by state legislatures. By the end of the 19th century, of course, corrupt state legislatures did nothing but send corrupt uh, senators to Washington on the payroll of the, of the railroads, of the banking interests, of the oil interests. And so the people rose up and said, no, we want to send the senator to Washington. So they passed a constitutional amendment that said that senators will be elected directly by the public, not by legislatures. So we've been there before. And there are answers to these problems. And I, I don't want to go in much longer, but I, I simply want to say two other things. One is that in 2008, on that election night in Chicago, uh, we made the mistake, many of us made the mistake, of believing that a leader could change the country alone. But even someone who was, who touched us as deeply as Barack Obama can't change the country alone. It takes sergeants and lieutenants. It takes citizens. A leader says this is the clarity, the, the, this is the direction, and it's clear. But it takes citizens. I mean, democracy is not a vicarious experience. It's not something you taste. Uh, it's not like eating dinner. It, you eat it, it's over. It's a continuing process. And if people aren't there, the moneyed interest will be there, and the people will be hurt. And so I look out and I say, the answer to our problems rests ultimately with citizens. If you take major movements in American history, you know, people say, well, I'm only one person. What can I do? In the book, I um, use the analogy of the Mississippi River. And I say, the Mississippi River starts somewhere as one drop of water that then combines with four or five drops of water, then forms a branch, then forms a creek, then forms a river, then a bigger river, until ultimately there it is, the Mississippi. That's the same way with democracy. It starts with one citizen and like one drop of water. It had to be one citizen sometime in our history who said, you know, slavery is immoral. I'm starting a movement called the abolitionists. It was another person in our history who said women ought to have a right to vote and started a movement called the suffragettes. There was another one person somewhere who said African Americans haven't been given the rights the Constitution guarantees them and we have to change that and the civil rights movement was formed. Somebody, one citizen said, you know, all this dirty water and dirty air, we need to have environmental laws that allow us to have clean air and clean water, the environmental movement was born. So it begins with individuals. And in the internet age, apathy is not an acceptable answer and shouldn't be an acceptable option. Look at what happened in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, you know, this tremendous transformation because people decided to take control of their own lives. Certainly, we can have a movement in the United States that holds uh, all politicians' feet to the fire on the issues that are most important to us. And I would suggest economics, the, best, the most important, and the things I've laid out would be a pretty good program to hold politicians' feet to the fire. And so, you know, I look out there and I see what's been happening in the economy. And, you know, there are times in American history where there are points of view that are irreconcilable. The period right before the Civil War comes to mind. But usually in American politics, uh, the way we settle our disputes is with bloody political, but is with vicious political c combat, but it isn't bloody combat. And it usually happens in one of three ways. One party wipes the other party out. 1932, Roosevelt sleep, 1964, um, the uh, Johnson sweep. Or if you're in a period like most of the time that I've represented in New Jersey, where 
you're pretty closely balanced, Republican and Democrat. The only way you get things done is reaching across the aisle and trying to get an agreement. I remember, for example, in 1986, uh, uh, I did the tax reform bill that was bipartisan. Alan Simpson did the immigration bill. And I went to Alan Simpson. And I had 22 questions about the bill. He and I sat in the office, no staff. He answered the questions for me. I agreed with him on 17 of the 22. I didn't agree with him on five. On balance, I said, you know, you have my support. At the end of that session, I didn't even know, I didn't even know what the Democratic position was. And so you in, and when you're in a world where all you do is go raise money, and when you're trying to play to the extremes, you don't get to know the other people. And you don't understand that in a legislature, what's absolutely essential is trust between legislators across party lines. I'll give you one example, and I won't go into too many stories, but one example. My last year in the Senate, there was this uh, gas pipeline explosion in New Jersey, up in Middlesex County. Okay, I'm the senator, this happened. Why were those pipelines there? So I'm doing a very strong amendment to make sure that anywhere there are gas pipelines, every municipality has to know and be a, consider that in zoning uh, decisions. So I put the amendment down on appropriations bill. I know it's not in order to put the amendment on appropriation bill, but I also know, having been there 18 years, that sometimes that's waived and the share is overruled, and, we go ahead and we do these things, and this is important to New Jersey, so I flipped this amendment down. Senator Trent Lott is the majority leader at that time from Mississippi. And um, I'm out there talking about New Jersey and about how we have to do these things. And he comes up to me and says, you know, we gotta wrap this up. We gotta wrap this up. I, I, I gotta move the business of the Senate forward. I said, go ahead and move the business. I wanna move the business of New Jersey forward. I'm sorry, I'm not yielding the floor. So we go on about another hour, an hour and a half, it comes out, look, they're pretty, really, sorry, I'm not, I'm not interested. I'm, I have the votes, and I'm gonna call for the vote shortly. Or maybe I'll go on. An hour later, he comes out and says, Bill, would you please take the, bill, the amendment down? If you do, I will guarantee you that I will see that it passes the Senate as the majority leader. And I said, you give me your word? He said, absolutely. I take the bill down. Six months later, I'm out of the Senate. I'm teaching at Stanford. One afternoon, I get a call from uh, somebody in Washington who identifies himself as the chief of staff of Senator Trent Lott. And he says, Senator Bradley? And I said, yeah. He said, I just want to let you know that um, that amendment that you put on a bill and Senator Lott said he would get past the Senate, just passed the Senate today. Now, I was out of the Senate, but he kept his word. That's the kind of trust that you need if you're going to build something for the long-term health of the country. One last point, citizen activism, the Tea Party, versus Occupy. There's a big difference between the two, and it's not the one that you think. That's obvious. The Tea Party had a very specific objective, roll back governments, and it decided immediately to get into electoral politics, and it elected 43 congresspeople who were Tea Party congressmen, some beating Democrats even. And they capitalized on the anger of the moment. And they elected 43 Democrats. And when S Speaker Boehnert and, and President Obama agreed in principle on a three to, tr three to four trillion dollar deficit reduction package, and Boehnert took it back to the House, the, the Republican caucus, those 43 rejected it. And by doing it, almost brought the country to bankruptcy. So when people say things can't change, look how fast they change. Of course they can change. Because citizens took involved and decided that they were gonna put people there and they had a specific objective and they were gonna seize the levers of power. Now take I Occupy. Great slogan, we're the 99%. Uh, call attention to something very important, income inequality in the country. And yet they had no program. 
What do you want to accomplish? Even some of them argued we shouldn't have a specific program because it, we'll, we'll have to choose one over others. Yeah, that's what the nature of the thing. And they didn't get involved in electoral politics. They chose intentionally not to seek to have their hands on the levers of power. So they, they don't have any right now. And they're not effective. So what you need in a democracy is you need the um, passion and the commitment of, say, Dr. Martin Luther King, whose dream and moral force drove Americans' consciousness about civil rights in America. But in order to make that dream and those moments when you feel like chills are going up and down your spine and we can be a different country by what someone speaks and what he says and what the lives are put on the line for the purpose and the cause, you also need somebody who knows how to pull the levers of the power, which in this case was Lyndon Johnson. And you know, there are two points. When Lyndon Johnson signed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, who do you think got the first pen? Here was Dr. Martin Luther King, here was Everett Dirksen, the Republican leader. He gave the pen to Everett Dirksen. And somebody said, well, why did you give it to Everett Dirksen? Why didn't you give it to Martin Luther King? And he said, because without Everett Dirksen delivering me 25 Republican votes, we could never have passed this bill. So there are plenty of things that are right about the country. And the reason I wrote this was to show us what are the things that are right about the country as well as the problems we have. And my hope is that it will restore some hope. And by the historical examples showing that we have overcome difficult times in the past and we can in the future. So it's a quick read and there are a lot of other stories. I could tell you any number of others, but I particularly want to leave for your reading a story about Jesse Helm's granddaughter. Thank you very much. Thank you.